Take your Bibles, if you would please, and turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, as we're working our way through the topic of forgiveness, pursuing restoration in our relationships and our friendships through forgiveness. The Christian Post relates the story of a young man named Chris Carrier. At age 10, Chris Carrier was kidnapped, stabbed with an ice pick in the head, and left for dead in the Florida Everglades. Over two decades later, when his attacker finally confessed, instead of seeking retribution, Chris Carrier shared the gospel. One Friday afternoon, as a 10-year-old carrier got off the bus in Coral Gables, Florida, a stranger approached and told him that he was planning a party for his dad and he needed his help with the decorations. Chris hopped into David McAllister's RV and sat in the passenger seat as the man drove out of town. McAllister then abruptly stopped the vehicle, pulled carrier into the center of the RV, forced him onto his back and began stabbing him in the chest. He literally stood back up and said, Son, I'm going to take you somewhere and I'm going to drop you off, Chris recalled. They wound up on a county road in the Everglades that was locally known as Alligator Alley. The man forced Chris to stand near a tree a short distance away. While Carrier, Chris Carrier, was looking down at the ground, McAllister pulled out a gun, aimed it at Carrier's left temple, and pulled the trigger. Now, last weekend, we reviewed the divine pattern for forgiveness, as Chris Braun defines it as, it's a commitment by the one true God to pardon graciously those who repent and believe so that they are reconciled to them, although this commitment does not eliminate all consequences. So we explored that last week. That one sentence summarizes the five ways in which God forgives us. We see that, that God's forgiveness is gracious, but it's not free. It costs something. In this case, it's the offended who forgives the offender. God's forgiveness is conditional. God's forgiveness is commitment, is a commitment. It's a willingness to cancel a debt. God's forgiveness leads to reconciliation. It balances out that, that, uh, that debt. But then we lastly, we saw that God's forgiveness does not eliminate all the consequences. We saw again last week, once again, looking at the monitor, L. Gregory Jones states on forgiveness that people are mistaken if they think Christian forgiveness primarily as an absolution from guilty. It's not saying I forgive you and you are now giving absolution. It's not like confession. The purpose of forgiveness, he writes, is the restoration of communion the reconciliation of brokenness. So it's more than someone just saying, I'm sorry, and someone then saying, okay. But it's to bring reconciliation. It's to lead to restoration. Now that we understand this command and the importance of forgiveness, we are left with the question of how that applies to us as we consider this pattern. In other words, how do you and I forgive as God forgives? And that's what Scripture says, right? We are to forgive as God has forgiven us. But you and I, we are not divine. We are not, we are just human. We have human feelings. We do not forget. We still have the old flesh that yearns to hold on to grudges. It embraces anger many times and swims in bitterness and resentment. However, we are still called to follow the divine pattern in pursuing restoration through forgiveness. Which leads us to our passage this morning in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, where it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you open up our minds and hearts this morning to the truth. Father, we do not want to be followers who grieve the Holy Spirit, but many times the hardness of our hearts when it comes to our relationships, to our friendships that have been broken due to trespasses, due to sin. Father, forgiveness is very difficult. 
but you called us to walk a manner that is worthy of our calling, of our conduct. So help us to do that this morning. Open our minds and hearts, even in this difficult topic, to understand how you are calling us to forgive as you have forgiven. In your name we pray. Amen. Paul warns the Christians at Ephesus not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Theologian Danny Burke writes that the verb translated grieve means to cause severe mental or emotional distress. The context of Ephesians 4.30 refers to the relationship between believers and neighbors. In other words, how we can grieve the Holy Spirit is in our relationships, Nolan, with our brothers and sisters. Going back to verse 25 of Ephesians 4, we read this. Therefore, putting away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry, do not sin. Do not let sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity, he says, to the devil. Let the thief steal no longer. Rather, let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with everyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. What Peter or Paul, excuse me, is teaching them in this passage, this church of Ephesus, is to avoid trespassing or sinning against each other. For this grieves the Holy Spirit, for it breaks the unity it, this is why God does not like a division and discord among the brethren, among those in the church. Yet knowing our sinful old flesh, Paul continues in Ephesians 4.31 here on the monitor, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. But then here's our key. Be kind to one another. Tender hearted forgiving one another, and here's that word again, as God in Christ forgave you. Again, we see the command to forgive others as God has forgiven us. That pattern, that divine pattern of forgiveness. So taking our cues from the divine pattern of God the Father, you and I now can define then what God's expectation for Christians is. So in other words, how are you and I to forgive since though we are not divine? But it's going to be very similar. As we see here on the monitor, it says forgiveness is a commitment by the offended. Now that's very important. It's the one who is trespassed upon. It's the one who has been heard. It's a commitment by that person, the offended, to pardon and graciously, or pardon graciously, excuse me, the repented from moral liability, to release them from anything that you may hold against them, and to be reconciled to that person, although not all consequences are necessarily eliminated. Just hold it there just for a moment. Maybe you want to take a picture of that on your phone so you have it. This is a definition that you and I need to look and read and let it marinate, let it go deeply within our hearts. Forgiveness is a commitment by the offended to pardon graciously the repentant from moral liability and to be reconciled to that person, although not all consequences are necessarily eliminated. That's what it means to forgive as God in Christ has forgiven us. Now, as you can see, there are three key concepts or ideas that is in this paragraph or in this little sentence that you and I need to adopt. Here's the three words if you want to write them down. The first one is graciously. The second is willingly. And the third one is freely. And we're going to break those up at this moment as there are three ways believers are to forgive. The first one, as you see here, is that Christians should forgive graciously. And we really should not say should, but Christians shall. Christians must forgive graciously. In biblical forgiveness, the forgiving party is the one who pays the price of forgiveness. Just as Jesus took it upon himself, he pays the price 
Yet he is also the one that is the offended. He is the one that has been rebelled against. He is the one that carries the trespasses of us. So in biblical forgiveness, the Bible is calling for you, the offended, the offended to forgive the offender. You're the one who's going to pay the price of forgiveness. This is clearly taught in Colossians chapter 3 that we read earlier, 12 through 13, where Lanny read, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has complaint against another, forgiving each other. Again, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. So it is incumbent upon us, the harmed, to forgive our abusers. Now that's not easy. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 12. This gracious offer of forgiveness is to be uh, unconditioned, uh, unconditional as Jesus modeled in Luke chapter 23. When he cried out to those who betrayed him, those who lied, who tortured and crucified him. When Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But we also see in the first martyr, Stephen, who also cried out to those who were stoning him for preaching the gospel, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Christians should forgive graciously. Now, these men had not begged nor asked for forgiveness when Jesus and Stephen uh, forgave them. No, but they offered it freely. They offered it graciously. In their hate and anger, speaking of those who were, who were the offenders, they willingly murdered both the Son of God and Stephen. Yet both were offered grace to their executioners. I pray that through their ministry, we may one day meet some of them in heaven. Many, again, would complain that this is not fair, this is not just. We live in a world where the offended demand retribution and reparation uh, from the oppressed. However, as we learn in Romans chapter 12, look at with me at verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, God knows this is going to be difficult. He says, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, you and I are to be gracious. For he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, this is difficult for those of us who have been harmed, who have been abused maybe many, many times, maybe a pattern that continues. This becomes different to, to offer great, uh, forgiveness graciously is very difficult. We may do it grudgingly, but we don't necessarily always do it graciously. But what we need to see here that the heart of a true Christian, of one who is one of Christ's followers, is to be willing to graciously forgive before anyone ever asks for forgiveness. Which leads us to number two. Christians for, Christian forgiveness involves a willing commitment to cancel the debt owed to them. We should forgive willingly. It should be something that we're wanting to do. It's not a hardening of a heart, but as we read earlier, it's about being kind and being tender-hearted. In Colossians, we saw that the Father willingly Commit, committed to cancel all the debt we owe him. But no matter how many times we have sinned, rebelled, or dis disobeyed God, he forgives all. King David sings that God forgives all your iniquities. He's redeemed our life from the pit. Ken Sande of Peacemakers Ministry, a ministry which is committed to helping restore and reconcile those that have uh, 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 difficult relationships. He summarizes four promises of the forgiving person. You might see it here. He says, I will not dwell on this incident. This is what you're committing to. I will not dwell on this incident, whatever it may be. Number two, I will not bring up this incident again and use it against you. I've released the debt. That's what forgiveness is, right? It's a canceling. 
as God has canceled all the record of debt. God does not bring it up against us. Number three, I will not talk to others about this incident. I'm not going to spend the time gossiping or bad talking someone. If a debt is canceled, it is canceled. And then number four, I will not let this incident stand between us or hinder our relationship. Keep that up there just for a moment. Again, read through those a little bit less quickly. And consider your hearts. Consider the debates, the discussions you might have with your spouse, your children, and others. Does it reflect this type of willing commitment? Not to bring things up, not to continually let it affect your life? As you continue to look at that, Sande uh, Sande summarizes these points when he writes, by making and keeping these promises, these four promises, you can tear down the walls that stand between you and your offender. Your promise not to dwell on or brood over the problems or to punish by holding that person at a distance. You clear the way for your relationship to develop unhindered by memories of past wrong. He is not saying that you forget him, but he says that a true heart that's willingly making a commitment, it says that we can get past these memories. This is exactly is what God does for us. And it's what he calls us to do for others, he writes. So in other words, to honor Christ and to walk worthy of our calling as a Christ follower, we must be both gracious and willing to forgive. Chris Braun, Pastor Chris Braun, remarks that any a Christian who is offended should gra- graciously wrap a present of forgiveness. So imagine a Christmas gift or a birthday gift wrapped up with a bow. He says they should graciously wrap a present of forgiveness and offer it to all who offended him or her. If the offender chooses to open the package, they will find forgiveness and reconciliation. So what we're looking at here is this is your part. You're to be gracious and willing to commit to offer forgiveness to someone. Now, that does not mean just as you give someone a gift, it does not mean that they have to take it and open it up and enjoy it. So we're looking at your choice today, not theirs. We're going to look at that in a moment. So you and I, God has called us as Christ followers. And our kindness and being tenderhearted and forgiving as God forgives is to be willing to commit to offer graciously forgiveness to those who have harmed us. Which leads us, though, to the third one. Christian forgiveness is a commitment to the repentant. Now, this is very important. Now, here is where we're going to just go a little bit off what is typically given as biblical forgiveness. Typically, biblical forgiveness says you just, you just forgive everyone. But here's the thing that we're trying to share with you. Biblically, the offer of forgiveness is given by the offended graciously and willingly, but forgiveness is not continued unless that person repents. Let me, let me go on to share with you why. Forgiveness is not at an automatic or unconditional. The offer is, but the fullness of it is not. God's forgiveness, as you might recall, is conditional. In Luke 17, verses 3 through 4, I believe this might be on here to screen. This is what Jesus says. He says, pay attention to yourself. If your brother sins, do what? Rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, repent, what is to say? You what? Must forgive him. But there's a key there. It's repentance. Theologians Lewis and Nito note that to repent means to change behavior as a result of a complete change of thinking and attitude. Of course, the issue that you and I face is whether someone is truly repentant or not. Is that someone I can trust? Are they truly repentant? Or are they just sorry that they got caught or the consequences? It can be very difficult for you and I to determine, especially if they continue to trespass us against us, either in new ways or in the same old pattern that they have. Remember, if I've been trying to share with you from the beginning, restoration, we're pursuing restoration through forgiveness. That begins with repentance. 
and then you can add then reconciliation, then you can lead to recreation, recreation, excuse me, then you have full restoration. At this point, to begin the process, you and I must be willing to graciously offer forgiveness, but then it's up to that person then to repent. Author Peter Kroll helps us understand the biblical concept of repentance so you and I can determine whether this person has truly repented. He knows there's five things that it is not. Number one, repentance is not a guilty feeling. Saul, King Saul, felt guilty when he was caught not obeying the commands of God. But he didn't repent. And as you and I know, he lost the kingdom to David. Judas felt guilty for betraying Jesus, but he didn't repent. Instead, he committed suicide. You could tell the difference. There's a difference between being sorry and being truly repentant. It's not just a guilty feeling. Repentance, number two, is not a confession. In these examples just mentioned, both Saul and Judas acknowledged their sin. They acknowledged that they were the offender, that they had disobeyed, that they were not true to what they have. And they both confessed the truth without, but in the end, they were just making self-justifications for their sin. And you can hear when someone's repenting, hey, you know, I'm sorry for saying that, but da, 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 da. that's not repentance. Neither demonstrated their repentance and God whetted his sword against them, giving us the picture of him, him sharpening his blade. So it's not a guilty fish, uh, f uh, feeling. It's not a confession. Repentance is not a feeling of grief, regret, or sorrow. The Apostle Paul once wrote a letter that led its readers to grieve over sin. It's, a, it's, a, it's a First Corinthians and in the follow-up letter, Paul commented that grief itself is not the same as repentance, as we see, is that godly or, or worldly sorrow leads to death. There's no salvation in it, but a godly repentance, a turning from sin leads to life. Godly grief will produce the fruit of, uh, godly grief is the only that will produce repentance. Worldly grief produces only death. Grief or sorrow alone does not mean a person has repented, it may be that they're just sorry of the consequences that they have to pay. Case in point, Esau. Remember the story of Esau and Jacob? He grieved over the loss of his blessing when he sold his birthright to his brother for just some stew. He regretted many of the choices that led him to that place. However, despite his tears, the Bible says that Esau never found repentance. He despised the birthright that God gave them. And so he was sorry that he lost it, but he wasn't truly repentant that he disobeyed and, and disobeyed and disregarded the gift of God. But here's another one to understand. And this is sometimes where we find ourselves. Repentance is not a liturgical act. Or let's say repentance is not just a series of, of Christian acts. It's not going to confession. It's not about putting more money in the plate. It's not attending more church or even just grabbing your Bible. All these things can be good in and of itself, but it's not just an act of saying, see, look at me doing actions here to show that I'm repentant. Though there can be some ways in which we do show outward repentance, but those visible acts of humiliation can be formed without repentance taking place. We see that example many times in the New Testament as Jesus would criticize the Pharisees for those types of acts. And then repentance, number five, is not a mere state of mind or heart. Take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter three. It's not a mere state of mind and heart. It's not about just something that takes place. John the Baptist preached about repentance, but he also called people to bear fruits. So there is a sense, again, as we should show outward uh, fruits of a, that we have truly repented. Upon being questioned, he provided particular people with observable behaviors that would qualify or demonstrate as fruits of repentance. It's found in Luke chapter 3. I think you might be there. Look at verse 10. And the crowds asked John the Baptist, what then shall we do when he says, bear fruits with your repentance, show that you're truly repentant? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with them who has none. 
And whoever has food is to do likewise. Then the tax collectors come. Remember, these people are just thieves. They also came to be baptized. And they said, teacher, what should we do to show that we truly have repented? And he said to them, collect no money than you are authorized to do. Do your jobs. Do it honestly. Soldiers also came and asked him, and we, what should we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusations and be content with your wages. So what were some demonstrable outward signs? He says, well, if you've been selfish, begin to share. Those who have used their authority to benefit others begin treating people fairly. Those who have used their strength to benefit themselves stop doing it and learn to be content. And we saw in our Ephesians chapter 4, it's be kind, be tenderhearted. It's putting away anger and malice. He did not send them off to cultivate an inner affection or attitude alone. He sent them off to obey the will of God from the heart. Therefore, while repentance is not merely an outward formality, it must involve the heart. It does not stay in the heart. It must be expressed, he says, in outward behavior. So let me summarize here. We are to offer forgiveness graciously. We are to offer it willingly, commitment not to bring these things up. However, Forgiveness is not finalized until that person repents. And that's demonstrating that there's not only a change of heart and mind, but it's exhibited in the way they live out. And so that's important for us to understand. And that's the three ways in which you and I are to forgive. Now, what does repentance mean in the Bible? If repentance is not just a mere feeling or a state of mind, it's not just a verbal confession or a liturgical act, then what is it? So you and I then need to understand, then who is it that I complete the forgiveness? Kroll highlights two examples. One is the liberation of Hebrew slaves. This is a, an old story, one that you may not have heard much in the Bible, but it's in Jeremiah 34. God complains through Jeremiah that many generations of Israel's Israelites failed to obey his command to set their slaves free every seven years. Now, in those days, when we're talking about slaves, people can indenture themselves to one another. That was an economic reality. This was not man-stealing. This was not buying slaves, so to speak, as we think in the American context. A man who was, did not have much money could go, like I could go to land and say, listen, I will work for you for seven years. Or he goes, hey, you owe me money. Can you pay it back? And I said, no, I can't, but I'll work it off. So I would work for seven years to pay off that loan. But at the end of the seven years, you were to release me, release that person. Israelites were not doing that. They were holding on to them, saying, no, you're going to be my slave until I tell you to do so. However, God calls them repentance because of that. And after they repented, he replies, you recently repented and did what was right in my own eyes by proclaiming liberty. So how did we know that the Israelites repented? Because they let the slaves go. Now remember, that would have been a great cost to themselves. The current generation repented by changing their ways. They stopped doing what they had been doing for generations, and they began to do what God had commanded them. However, that did not last long, as eventually, as we know, Israel once again fell into old sinful habits. But then let's consider Jonah. We all love the story of Jonah. And the people of Nineveh, Jonah is sent to Nineveh to call them to repentance. They were a very wicked people, the Assyrians. The second example here is Nineveh, when he went to Nineveh and said, preach destruction to that city. And what we see is they believed God's word of judgment, and they immediately responded, responded in visible and voluntarily humiliation. You might recall that the king himself went in in sackcloth and ashes to show, calling all of his subjects to repent. It was not only a public dem demonstration of guilt and regret, but also there was an immediate change of behavior. Jesus later affirms that what the Ninevites did qualified as true repentance. And thus, they secured the lavish mercy of God was not just their acts of public humiliation, but the fact that they turned from their wicked ways. So that's how you and I should see and demonstrate, has someone truly repented? From other parts of Scripture, we see similar examples seen here in the monitor. 
In Acts, we see that those who turned away from their sins find forgiveness and refreshments. In Psalm, we see those who were not seeking God began to seek Him. And in 1 Kings, those who suffered judgment for their sins turn away from that sin and stop doing it. That's how you and I can determine those that we can begin the reconciliation process with. Until repentance is demonstrated, you and I continue to offer graciously and willingly commit to offer forgiveness, but yet we cannot find reconciliation until the offender truly repents and demonstrates that. These examples highlight the fact that the essence of repentance is life change. Repentance is when a disobedient person stops disobeying and begins obeying. Such repentance ought to be, off, ought to be accompanied by confessions of wrongdoing, not self-justification, feelings of guilt or regret, and, and things of that. But none of those things qualify as repentance unless that person is changing their hearts and their minds and their attitudes. So how does this work? What if I graciously and willingly and freely offer forgiveness to someone who has hurt me? So think of an example. Think of someone right now in your mind who has hurt you. Many of you might be dealing with this subject. I believe there probably many of you are. They say, well, how do I begin this process? What if I graciously and willingly and freely begin to offer forgiveness to someone who has hurt me? but they continue to hurt me. They continue to harm me. Their, their attitudes and actions have not changed. Pastor Dan Phillips in his blog, Biblical Christianity, helps us to understand how you and I can approach these things, how you and I can get in the gritty ditty, or what's that, gritty nitty, the gritty nitty, and get into the dirt or whatever it is, or the rubber meets the road, whatever idiom you want. How is it that we then get into it? He says, Jesus says, Pay attention to yourself. He quotes that verse we read just earlier. He says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Again, the key word is what? If. If. If he sins, I'm told to forgive him. Uh, oh, so, I'm sorry. If, I, if he sins, uh, Dan Phillips writes, he says, I'm not told to forgive him, but to what? Rebuke him first. To call them out. To tell them they've sinned against you that they offended you. Tell him what he has done is wrong and why it's wrong. And then if he repents, if he admits that what he's done is a sin, I am to forgive him. But Jesus says nothing about what to do in this section if he does not repent. As we mentioned earlier, we are to pursue restoration through forgiveness. This process begins with our heart first as we extend the grace of God that has been offered to us as rebellious sinners as we continue to choose willingly to commit to love our neighbor as ourselves and to freely offer forgiveness as God has. Then the process of forgiveness is dependent on the heart of the offender. Will they repent or continue to harden their hearts? And most likely that's where you and I are. I pray that there any hand that is in here listening to me, watching me later, is that you have a heart that's tender. And you are willing and gracious to offer forgiveness to those that have harmed you. I pray that's where your heart is. If not, then begin praying, Lord, help me. My heart has been hardened. My conscience has been seared. But what you and I need to understand is what do we do? Pastor Chris Prawn writes about the importance and necessity of repentance when he says, consequences are important for the sake of justice. We saw this with God last week. A willingness to accept consciousness for sinful behavior is actually good evidence by, that the offender truly is repentant. So at this point, you do not offer. The consequences must be paid. Too often, we try to eliminate or to limit the consequences of someone else's sin as well as ours. We do that with our children. And what we trade them is to avoid all things that God is using in discipline to train us. Pastor Dan Phillips continues to instruct us when he says, so what does it mean to be unforgiving in such circumstances? Simply, here's what you and I to do. When someone will not repent, is we're to regard that sin as a current issue. 
In other words, reconciliation at this point is not possible. It is not. And I get people many times that come to me and say, hey, help me in my marriage, help me in my friendships, help me with my boss, whatever. I want things the way they used to be. And, I, and I'm with you. I want them to do be that way. But you cannot get the way it used to be until you deal with the reconciliation, the things that are wrong in your marriage or in your relationship. But you can't get reconciliation until there's repentance. Now, that may be repentance by both parties. Because many times there's, there's two ways in which things are going. So we ourselves have to have that heart of repentance. You may be also the offender and as well as the offended. He goes on to say, I must not take vengeance, but I must rather bless, love, and do good. There may be sometimes there may sometimes be consequences for another sin, but the no, motive is not revenge, and the attitude is not bitter hatred. As Christians, you and I are to offer forgiveness graciously, willing, and freely. As we seek out the two great commandments, to love God with all our heart, our soul, and our might, and also to love our neighbor as ourselves. You and I are to leave justice up to God, as Paul writes to the Church of Rome. We read it earlier. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay. So we have someone, I'm asking you today, are you willingly, graciously willing to commit to forgiveness? Are you offering it freely? And that means that you and I are not harboring resentment, bitterness, anger, malice, even if they choose not to repent, we see that as sin. And that's the problem, really, is too many times we see sin, we see someone who trespass against us as a sin against us and not understanding that in all things, primarily sin is against God. And we need to recognize that. Is that may be judgment against those. God will repay and so if anything, we ought to be willing and graciously uh, and freely ready to, for, to offer forgiveness so that they may be one and not taste the fire of hell. Going back to our story of Chris Carrier and his attacker, for those who may not have been in here, this is a young man that at 10 years of age was kidnapped, stabbed with an ice pick repeatedly, and then shot and left, in the, left to die. The last thing Chris remembered before he awoke several days later, his dad told him when he awoke, Chris, you were kidnapped, you were shot through the head, and you were left to die in the Florida Everglades. And you were missing for six days. We could not find you. 22 years later, so he's 32 at this time, Chris received a phone call from the police chief at the sheriff's department who found the man who had attempted to murder him and offered him the opportunity to meet McAllister face-to-face. Chris accepted. Now, Chris writes, this is the definition of awkward. What do you say to the guy who last time you saw him try to put a bullet through your head? This is a true story, by the way. When Carrie or Chris, when Chris met McAllister in the nursing home, This time, McAllister was not doing well. He was in a nursing home where he was being cared for at the end of his life. Chris told him, Mr. McAllister, I'd like you to know what's really been the source of my strength through all of this. He shared with him the gospel and prayed with him. He spent that week visiting McAllister, left an impression. And so Carrier, Chris, Chris Carrier, shared the gospel with him as best as he could. Chris says this, I want you to know that there is nothing between you and me except our newfound friendship. I want you to know I forgive you. Chris, who has every reason to be angry, to have malice, bitterness, to wish this man would die, freely, graciously, and willingly offered forgiveness to the man who had kidnapped him and attempted to kill him. Though he was blind and physically weak, 
McAllister rolled over in his hospital bed, grabbed Chris's hand as though he could see it, and through tears said, I'm sorry. McAllister then prayed to receive Christ. I can guarantee that there is no one sitting in this room or listening to me that has ever suffered that type of harm or abuse from someone. You might have suffered physically, emotionally, mentally, but never to that degree. McAllister told a CNN reporter that Chris Carrier was the best friend he ever had. Here's the point as we get close to the closing. We here on earth cannot calculate the power of offering forgiveness to those who have offended us, to those who have harmed us, to those who have abused us. Just as God's kindness is meant to lead sinners to repentance, so our very act of graciously, willingly, and freely offering forgiveness may, may lead one to repentance and prayerfully to Christ. That's why we willingly, graciously, freely offer forgiveness. It's not completed. Reconciliation does not, reconciliation does not begin until the repentant accepts their role. But as we come to James chapter 5, 19, James says this, my brothers, if any one of you wanders from the truth, they're not kind, they're not tenderhearted, they're abusive, they're harmful. This could be a father, this could be a mother, this could be an uncle, this could be work, this could be a brother, a sister. He says, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. I pray that there's no one here that would rather have vengeance against their offender than to save them from hell. So where's your heart? Is your heart so hardened against your abuser, your offender, that you cannot graciously, willingly, and freely offer them forgiveness? Is your conscience so seared is bitterness, malice, and anger such a close friend that you want to hold them dear and you will not release it? I pray that it's not so. Because if it is so, my friend, then I'm afraid you yourself may be in danger of hellfire. Repentance is what God has called us to. And so you and I, we cannot pursue restoration, or the first step in our restoration is Repentance whether we rebuke and all call them to repentance or whether you are the offender and you have a need to go to someone and repent of your own sin, of your own trespass against them. Next week, forgiveness, as we saw, is linked to reconciliation. When God forgives, he not only pardons sinners from guilty from guilt, but he also begins a new relationship with him. The, the Bible never speaks of God's forgiveness apart from reconciliation. So far in our series, we've understand the importance and the command of forgiveness. We saw the divine pattern of forgiveness. We look today and see the first step of repentance is to offer it freely, willingly, and graciously to those who repent. Next week, we're going to look at reconciliation. How then do we deal with in pursuing relationships through reconciliation and using forgiveness. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm just going to ask the worship team and Randy to come up. And I want you to pause and consider these words. For you know what? We are all offenders and we are all offended. Repentance is what God is calling to. So whether it's for you this morning to offer it or whether it's here for you to repent, I pray that you would see the importance of doing so. For you and I are called to forgive as God has forgiven us. And our kindness in offering that could very well be the key to leading them
to God. Recognizing, yes, consequences are not eliminated. There's always consequences. But you and I are to seek the good of those that press against us. Fanny, would you come and share with us pastor's prayer this morning? We hope you enjoyed this episode of Walking in Faith. We encourage you to share this with others. If you have any questions or comments, please visit us online or email us at info at orangevilla.org. Till next time, may God bless you in everything you do.